This is Algebra Lecture 10. And let me remind you that the midterm is exactly two weeks from today, which is March 15th, nine o'clock to 1040 in Gillette. 205 in person not on zoom at all okay and we're getting towards the end of chapter 7 and what we're up to is section 1.8 on polynomials. And <clears throat> polynomials are things that you know very well from pre-calculus and calculus, certainly. Um, so if we have two polynomials, say f of x is the polynomial 7x squared minus 2x plus 3, and g of x is the polynomial minus 2x cubed plus 7x squared plus x minus 1. If you add the polynomials, you're just adding term by term, minus 2x cubed, 7x squared plus 7x squared is 14x squared, minus 2x plus x is minus x, 3 minus 1 is 2. And if you subtract the polynomials, you're also subtracting term by term, minus 2x cubed, oops, sorry, um, taking f minus g, so it's minus minus 2x cubed, which is plus 2x cubed. 7x squared minus 7x squared is 0. Minus 2x minus x is minus 3x. And 3 minus minus 1 is 4. So this is, again, just <clears throat> elementary arithmetic. f of x times g of x, we're multiplying 7x squared minus 2x plus 3 times minus 2x cubed plus 7x squared plus x minus 1. We just distribute across 7x squared times all of this is minus 14x to the fifth plus 49x to the fourth plus 7x cubed minus 7x squared. <clears throat> minus 2x times all of this, minus 2x times minus 2x cubed is plus 4x to the fourth. Minus 2x times 7x squared is minus 14x cubed. Minus 2x times plus x is minus 2x squared. Minus 2x minus one times minus 1 is plus 2x. And then 3 times this, you get minus 6x cubed plus 21x squared plus 3x minus 3. So when you add this all up, the product is minus 14x to the fifth plus 53x to the fourth. Let's see, this is 7 minus 20 is minus 13x cubed. 21 minus 9 is 18x squared plus 5x minus 3. And I never do arithmetic without making mistakes, so I would go back and check everything. But one way or another, term by term, working carefully, we get the product of the polynomials. And addition and multiplication of polynomials satisfy exactly the elementary rules that are satisfied in arithmetic. 
So suppose we let K, capital K, be the field of um, real numbers, usually denoted by R, or for example, it could be complex numbers, which is usually denoted by C. So uh, if you don't know complex numbers, then um, look in the appendix of the book or somewhere and learn them. But by the time you take 300 level classes, you have to be completely familiar with the complex numbers. They're very simple and the real numbers. And everything we're doing works for polynomials where the coefficients are either real or complex. These are both called fields. So the real number is a field, the complex numbers are a field. And by k square bracket x, we mean the set of all polynomials with coefficients in the field k. So for example, if you take the polynomial f of x equals 2x squared plus 3x minus 11. This is in the set of polynomials with real coefficients because 2, 3, and minus 11 are real numbers. The same polynomial is also in the field of polynomials with complex coefficients because the complex numbers contain the real numbers, right? Every Real number is a complex number. If you think of complex numbers of being of the form z equals x plus yi, then, for example, um, uh, z equal 2 plus 3i is a complex number. But if you just take the number 2, that's also the same as 2 plus 0 times i. Right? That's a complex number. So the real numbers certainly contain the complex, are certainly contained in the complex numbers. But if you take the polynomial um, 3 plus 2i x squared minus 7i x plus 11, these coefficients are complex. So these are, this is a polynomial in the set of polynomials with complex coefficients, but this is not in. This symbol, the in sign with a slash to it means not in. This is not a polynomial with real coefficients. <clears throat> and some properties of polynomials, and these properties are collected in proposition 1.8.2, so, so addition of polynomials is commutative and associative. Commutative just means f plus g equals g plus f. Associative means f plus g plus h is the same as f plus g plus h. So the usual rules for adding numbers apply to adding polynomials. And multiplication is also commutative and associative. Right? f times g is g times f. And fg times h is f times gh when fg and h are polynomials. And we have an identity under multiplication. This is just a polynomial. This is the constant polynomial f of x equal to 1 for all x. And 1 times any polynomial is just the polynomial. And we also have a distributive law, 
which is for any polynomials, F times G plus H is FG plus FH. So these are the most elementary properties of polynomials that in calculus you use all the time without necessarily giving a name to them. Okay. So if you have a polynomial f of x equals um, am x to the m plus am minus 1 x to the m minus 1 plus a1x plus a0. And if it's not the zero polynomial, it's not the polynomial which is identically equal to zero, um, what is called the degree of f is the was it can you move down we can see oh sorry the degree of f is the largest power of x with a non-zero coefficient so for example the following polynomials have degree three, x cubed, seven x cubed, seven x cubed plus two x minus 11, zero times x to the fourth plus seven x cubed plus two x minus 11, zero times x to the fifth plus zero times x to the fourth plus seven x cubed plus two x minus 11. All of these polynomials have degree three because in each of them, the highest power of X with a non-zero coefficient is power three. So even though you have X to the fourth here, the coefficient is zero. And in this polynomial, the coefficients of X to the fourth and X to the fifth are zero. So the degree is three. And by degree of P, this is just our notation for the degree of the polynomial p. Again, uh, I shouldn't be telling you anything you don't know. You always talked about the degree of a polynomial, a quadratic polynomial is degree two, <coughs> and so forth. And proposition 1.8.5, <laughs> collect some simple properties of polynomials. If f and g are non-zero, um, by the way, you say, uh, I define the degree of a non-zero polynomial. Uh, sometimes we say the degree of the zero polynomial is minus infinity. So this is the zero polynomial. So to the extent that you ever need to know or use something for the degree of the polynomial, which is zero always, that degree is minus infinity. If you take the degree of the constant polynomial, so C is a non-zero constant. So this polynomial is like C x to the zero, right? That's C. The highest power of x with a non-zero coefficient is zero. So for a non-zero constant polynomial, the degree is zero. But for the zero polynomial, we define the degree to be minus infinity. So if you take two polynomials, f and g, not equal to zero, the degree of fg is the degree of f plus the degree of g. Um, as you can see, if you have for example, 7x cubed plus 2x times minus 5x squared plus 11. When you multiply that out, the leading term, the term with the highest non-zero coefficient, you get minus 35x to the fifth plus 77x cubed minus 10x cubed, makes 67x cubed. Um, 
plus 22x. The degree is 5, and 5 is 3 plus 2, right? So the degree of a product of two polynomials is the sum of the degree. And what about the, the degree of the sum of two polynomials? So the degree of f plus g is what? Well, let's look at two examples. Uh, if you take f to be 7x cubed plus 2x and g to be minus 5x squared plus 11, then f plus g is 7x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 11. The degree of f plus g is 3, and the degree of f is 3, and the degree of g is 3. So the degree of f plus g is the larger of these two different degrees. But of course, you could have something like this. You could have f of x equals 7x cubed plus 2x, and g of x is minus 7x cubed minus 5x squared. And then if you add them, f plus g, the x cubes cancel. You get minus 5x squared plus 2x. And now the degree of the sum is 2, which is smaller than the degree of both of the sum ends. And the general rule is the degree of f plus g is at most the maximum of the two degrees, the degree of f and the degree of g. If the degree of f and degree of g are different, then the degree of f plus g is the maximum. If the degree of f equals the degree of g, there might be some cancellation and the degree goes down. But in no case does the degree of the sum of two polynomials ever become larger than the degree of either of the sum ends. Okay. So when we were looking at the integers, we defined prime numbers and factorizations, the whole idea of one number dividing a number, and the unique factorization theorem, that every positive integer is a product of powers of prime numbers uh, in a unique way up to order. And there's a completely analogous theory of divisibility of polynomials. So remember for integers, A and B, uh, we say that A divides B. If B is AQ, for some integer q. And we can say the same thing for polynomials. So for polynomials, f and g, we say f divides g if g is f times q for some polynomial q. So for example, x minus one, f equal x minus one, divides g equal to x cubed minus one because x cubed minus one is x minus one times x squared plus x plus one. So this is my f, this is my g, and this is the quotient q. Oops, sorry. Um, this is my g, this is my f, and this is my quotient q. So it's exactly the same definition of divisibility for polynomials as for um, integers. And divisibility satisfies some basic properties. 
which are collected in Proposition 1.8.6. But maybe before I go on, I need to ask if there are any questions so far, right? This is, we talked about this on Monday uh, a bit, um, but this is fundamental algebra. And the theory only takes a short time to develop. You'll see in the text, it's just, you know, four or five pages, but you really should be spending a lot of time with pencil and a lot of paper studying this and looking at examples, numerical examples. Examples of polynomials. So proposition 1.8.6 starts as follows. Let F, G, H, U, and V be polynomials with coefficients in the field K, which means uh, K is either the reals or the complexes, but the only thing we need to know about the real and the complex numbers is you can not only add, subtract, and multiply them, but if the number is non-zero, you can divide by it. That's what it means to have a field. So what are some prop properties of divisibility of polynomials? If the product of two polynomials is one, then u and v are constants. Right? For example, three times a third is one, and three and a third are real numbers or complex numbers. They're in the field K. But what this says is the only time a product of two polynomials is equal to one is if both polynomials are actually non-zero constants. The second statement says that if F divides G and G divides F, then there exists some number K such that G equals K times F for some number K, some element of the field, some real or complex number. Uh, So, for example, if you were dealing with numbers, 3 divides minus 3. Plus minus 3 is 3 times 1. And minus 3 divides 3. Because 3 is minus 3 times minus 1. And in fact, the only reason this is true is because of something like this. Right. One of these numbers is a scalar, a number, times the other number. But for polynomials, if one polynomial divides the second and the second divides the first, then each polynomial is just some constant multiple of the other. That's what this says. The third pro pro property is what we would call transitivity. If F divides G and G divides H, then F divides H. And the fourth is another consequence of the definition. If F divides G and F divides H, then F divides <coughs> SG plus TH for all polynomials. S and T. And again, if you translate this back into integers, you'll see that we proved every one of these things holds for the integers. Right? <coughs> so let me prove some of these properties, starting with the first. So proof that u, v equal one. Then u is not zero and v is not zero because if either of u or v were zero, the product would be zero, not one. So 
And one, that's a constant polynomial, the degree of a non-zero constant is zero. But that's the degree of u times v. And the degree of the product of two polynomials is the sum of the degrees. So this number plus this number equals zero. But the degree of any polynomial is always greater than or equal to zero. We haven't defined anything like a negative degree. So if these two numbers add up to zero and they're both at least zero, that means the degree of u and the degree of v are both zero. And the only time a polynomial degree zero is if they're constants, right? So u is a constant and v is a constant, right? So u, v are constant non-zero. polynomials. <clears throat> okay. What about part B? So any questions about this? I mean, these are proofs. Uh, these are hard to understand in the beginning, always. Uh, and you need to, but each of these is a proof you're expected to know. And if I ask you to do, give a proof of this on the exam, this is an example of a proof you would have to give. Part B says, so suppose we have two polynomials, F and G, F divides G and G divides H. So F divides G means g is equal to v times f for some polynomial v. I'm sorry. Um, this, I, this is true, but this, this is not part b. Part b was if f divides g and g divides f. So this first statement is certainly still true. Suppose f divides g and g divides f. So f divides g means g is v times f for some polynomial v. And g divides f means f is u times g for some polynomial u. So... <clears throat> If I put this um, together, I get G is V times F, but F is U times G, which is by associativity VU times G. So if I subtract one side from the other, G minus VU times G is zero, right? If this equals this, the difference is zero. And because I can factor, I have distributivity. This is the same as G times one minus VU. So this polynomial is zero. And if a product of two polynomials is zero, at least one of them is zero, because if each was were non-zero, they would have degrees and the product would have some degree which is not minus infinity. So this implies that either g equals zero or one minus vu equals zero. Of course, if g equals zero, you could take v equal to zero. If g equals zero, f equals zero, so any constant will work. The only case to consider is one minus vu equals zero. In other words, uv or vu equals one, which means u and v are both constants, right? We proved that the product of two polynomials is one, they're actually constants. So we're done. G is v times f, where v is a constant. That's what we needed to prove.
property C, the third property that I need to prove is transitivity. So F divides G means G is U times F. G divides H means H is V times G. But G is U times F, so that's V times UF or VU times F. So H is something times F. So F divides H. Professor. Is there a question? Uh, can you move up the paper? We couldn't see the last part of the proof. Uh, right here? No, the second one that you did. Um, yeah, can you move down? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So this says, if you have two polynomials f and g, and f divides g and g divides f, then we want to prove that uh, g is a, some some number, some scalar times f. So if f divides g, g is v times f for some polynomial v. And if g divides f, f is u times g for some polynomial u. So g is v times f, but f is ug, so I plug ug in for f, so I get vu times g. And if I subtract, this minus this, I get zero. And I can factor out the G. So G times one minus VU is zero. So one of these factors has to be zero. And of course, if G is zero, F is zero. So G is, for example, one times F. Zero is one times zero. But if G is not zero, then one minus VU is zero, which means V times U or U times V is one. And I prove that only happens if u and v are both constants. So g is a constant times f, and f is a constant times g. That's what we needed to prove. And the last is to prove d. Suppose if f divides g, then g is u times f. And if f divides h, then h is v times f. So if I take any polynomial of the form sg plus th, for any polynomials s and t, this is s times g, g is uf, plus t times h, h is vf, this is su plus tv times f. So f times something is equal to this, so F divides SG plus TH for all polynomials S and T. So those are the proofs of all four parts of that proposition. And I said, I want to somehow mirror arithmetic with polynomials. So in arithmetic, we show that we defined a prime number. It's a positive number whose only divisors are itself and one, positive number bigger than one. And we prove that every number, every positive number is a product of primes uniquely. And every integer is plus or minus one times a product of primes. And we'll, I want to show that something completely analogous is true in polynomials. So we need the analog of an, a prime number. And for the primes, uh, we don't call them prime polynomials. We call them irreducible. So... So I want to consider f of x 
a polynomial with degree of f at least one. So not a not a number, but actually a polynomial with positive degree. Um, of course, you could always write f as, for example, one third times three f, and say, oh, that's a factorization. But this is kind of trivial because the third times three is one. So this is you think of this as a trivial factorization. We don't even want to consider it a factorization of all. We want to say that we're interested in non-trivial factorizations if they exist. So a non-trivial factorization would be um, where f is g times h with the degree of g at least one and the degree of h at least one. So x squared minus one equals x minus one times x plus one is a factorization. Because this polynomial is a product of two polynomials. So this is like my f, that's my g, and this is my h, and these each have degree one, they're not constants. If we take polynomials with real coefficients, sorry, if we take polynomials with complex coefficients, x squared plus one also factors. This is x plus i times x minus i, where i squared is minus one. This is These are polynomials with complex coefficients. So this is a factorization in the complex over the complex numbers. But x squared plus one can also be considered as a polynomial with real coefficients. And in if you're just looking at polynomials with real coefficients, this polynomial does not factor. So these factors, these polynomials do not have real coefficients, they have complex coefficients. Mm -hmm. So whether a polynomial factors or not depends on what the coefficients are that you're allowed to consider. So if you're only considering real numbers, this polynomial does not factor. If you're considering complex numbers, the same polynomial does factor. And we say that a polynomial, let me write this on a new sheet of paper because it's so important. A polynomial F with coefficients in the field K is called irreducible. if there do not exist polynomials g and h in k of x such that f factors into g times h and g and h are not constants. Degree of g is at least one and degree of h is at least one. So if this does not happen, the polynomial is called irreducible. It can't be written as the product of non-constant polynomials of lower degree. And an important proposition, this is 1.8.8, .8, says the following, every polynomial f with coefficients in x with the degree of f at least one, so it's not a constant, it can be written as or is the product of irreducible polynomials. In other words, every polynomial can be factored into a product of irreducibles. Of course, 
if the polynomial you start with is itself irreducible, it's just the product of itself or by itself. It's a product of one irreducible. If it's not irreducible, then it factors. And the proof of this, um, one way to prove this quickly is by induction on the integer d, which we'll call the degree of f. So if d equals 1, then f is a polynomial of degree 1. So it can be written like this. And this is irreducible. Every polynomial of degree 1 is irreducible. Because if it's a product of two polynomials, the degree is the sum of the degrees, and the smallest degree is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 2. So a reducible polynomial has degree at least 2. So every polynomial of degree 1 is irreducible, which already tells us there are infinitely many irreducible polynomials. Plus all the polynomials of the form x plus a naught is irreducible for different a naught. So suppose that D is um, at least two and every polynomial of degree at most d minus 1 factors. So I have to prove, so the induction hypothesis is that there's some number d at least 2, and every polynomial of smaller degree factors. And I want to prove that every polynomial of degree d factors. So let f be a polynomial whose degree is d. If f is irreducible, we're done. F is equal to F. It's a product of one polynomial. If F is not irreducible, then F is G times H. This is a factorization into non-constant polynomials. So the degree of G is less than D. And the degree of h is less than d because the sum of these two positive integers equals d. So f factors into g times h, but g has degree at most d minus 1. So this factors. And h has degree at most d minus 1. So this factors. So f is g times h, but g is a product of irreducible polynomials. And H is a product of irreducible polynomials. So the product is a product of irreducible polynomials. And that completes the proof. Now, I have to emphasize that knowing that something factors is completely different from knowing how to factor it. So as we know, every positive integer is a product of primes, but it's one of the biggest unsolved problems in mathematics <coughs> to be able to factor a large integer into a product of primes in a reasonable amount of time. That's uh, one of the most fundamental unsolved problems in mathematics today. And if you have a polynomial, we know that it factors into irreducible polynomials, but we don't know how to compute the factorization. That's So there's a difference between knowing something happens and being able to know exactly how it happens. Now, one of the key steps in proving the prime, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that every number 
factors into primes was the Euclidean algorithm for long division. So So then we just remind you, what is the Euclidean algorithm for integers? Um, you take a number like 33 and a number B, let's see, let's make it more interesting. Um, no. Equal 15, and you wanna find the greatest common divisor. So you take 33, no, that's no. That's fifteen times two plus three. This is the remainder. You take fifteen, divide it by three, you get five, and the remainder is zero. So the greatest common divisor is three. So the greatest the Euclidean algorithm for integers is based on the fact that if you have integers a and b and b is positive, you can always write a as b q plus r where r, the remainder, is between zero and b minus one. That's the key for arithmetic, this division algorithm. And we have a similar division algorithm for polynomials. So this is stated in the text. I'm running out all this these references down so you know exactly where to find them in the book. That P and D be um, polynomials in this set of polynomials with coefficients in the field K. And suppose that the degree of P is at least the degree of D, which is, we even allow a constant uh, polynomial, at least zero. So we have non-zero polynomials P and D, and P has degree greater than or equal to D, What I want to prove is um, so then there exist polynomials Q and R such that remember for integers divide A by B you get a quotient and a remainder and the remainder is smaller than what you're dividing by. For polynomials if you take polynomials F and D you'll be able to write F as what you're dividing by D times some quotient Q plus a remainder. These are polynomials where either R equals zero or the degree of R is strictly less than the degree of D. So the division algorithm for polynomials, so this is actually uh, lemma 1.812 as a step in the improving this. This is proposition 1.813. That given one polynomial and another, you can always divide and get a remainder. This is just long division. So let me just take an example uh, at random. Suppose I take F to be, 7x cubed plus 2x plus 1, and g to be um, 2x squared plus 3, All right? So I want to divide f by g and get a quotient and a remainder. So this is what you should have learned to do somewhere before calculus. You're dividing 2x squared plus 3 into 7x cubed plus 2x plus 1. 
So 2x squared into 7x cubed goes 7 halves x times. Because 7 halves x times 2x squared is 7x cubed. So, so when you're just doing our ordinary long division, 7 halves x times this, we get 7x cubed plus 7 times 3 is 21 over 2 plus 21 over 2x. And when I subtract 2x minus 21 over 2x, that's minus 17 over 2x plus 1. 2x cubed into this goes no times. So what we get is that 7x cubed plus 2x plus 1 is what we're dividing by 2x squared plus 3 times the polynomial 7 halves x plus the remainder of minus 17 over 2x plus 1. So this is my f dividing by, or this is my g, sorry, this is my f dividing by g. This is my quotient and this is my remainder. The remainder is linear. It has degree 1 and it's 1 is less than 2. So maybe just to make sure, or just to compel you to practice some long division, here's a simple problem. Um, let um, f be the polynomial um, 7x to the fourth plus 2x cubed plus x minus 1. And let g be the polynomial x squared plus 1. So divide f by g. So I want to I mean, find polynomials q and r such that f is g times q plus r. And the degree of r is less than, greater than or equal to zero, and less than the degree of g, which is two. So spend a minute and just do some long division. Divide x squared plus one into this. And tell me what you get. Okay, so does anyone have a quotient and a remainder? Let me try and do it. So I'm going to have the polynomial 7x to the fourth plus 2x cubed plus x minus 1 divided by x squared plus 1. So this goes into this 7x squared times. And 7x squared times x squared plus 1 is 7x to the fourth plus 7x squared. And when I subtract this from this, I get 2x cubed minus 7x squared plus x minus 1. And then I divide x squared plus 1 into this, and this goes 2x times. So I get 2x cubed plus 2x. And when I subtract, I get minus 7x squared. x minus 2x is minus x minus 1 x squared plus 1 into this goes minus 7 times. I get minus 7x squared minus 7. When I subtract, I get minus x plus 6. And x squared plus 1 doesn't divide into this because this has smaller degree. Can you so move this up? Is, this is my quotient. 7x squared plus 2x minus 7. And this is my remainder. And again, uh, I always make mistakes with arithmetic. So I would check either multiply this by x squared plus 1 and add this and see what you get, or just go through this step by step. OK.
So whoever started off Elizabeth and got 7x squared plus 2x, that's exactly correct. Yeah. Again, if um, you need some help reviewing, learning how to do long division of polynomials, um, you can always go to the Math and Statistics Student uh, Help Center in Gillette, and they'll help you. Okay. So how do we begin to prove the unique factorization of polynomials? So the first step, as I mentioned a moment ago, is lemma 1.8. 12. So we have polynomials P and D with coefficients in X. And the degree of P is greater than or equal to the degree of D, which is non-zero. So the degree is greater than or equal to zero. And the lemma says that there exists a polynomial with one just one term, which is called a monomial. So a monomial is just a polynomial with a single term, say bx to the k. There's only one power of x. And there exists a polynomial, p prime, with coefficients in the field k, such that I can take P, divide it by M, and I get a polynomial, sorry, I can take P and divide it by D. I can write P as M times D plus P prime, where the degree of P prime is strictly less than the degree of P. So let me just explain what this means. Um, here we had an example where I was doing long division. So I have this polynomial, 7x to the fourth plus 2x cubed plus x minus d. And I'm dividing it by x squared plus 1. And in the very first step, I get a monomial 7x squared. And this polynomial is equal to x squared plus 1 times 7x squared. That's this. And the difference is this. So what I have here is that this is the first step in long division. 7x to the fourth plus 2x cubed plus x minus 1 is x squared plus 1 times the monomial 7x squared plus my remainder, which is 2x cubed minus 7x squared plus x minus 1. So this is my p. And this is my d. And P is D times some monomial plus a remainder, which is smaller than the polynomial I started with. Not smaller than X squared plus one, but smaller than this. So that's what this lemma says. It says, if you take polynomials P and D, D has degree no bigger than P. I can write P as some monomial, some a single term times D, 
plus a remainder p prime of which is degree smaller than the polynomial I started with. So let me use the notation and the, the proof that's in the text. Suppose p is a n x to the n plus a n minus one x to the n minus one down to a zero and d is b sub s x to the s plus b sub s minus one x to the s minus one down to b zero. So the degree of p is n, which is greater than or equal to s, which is the degree of d. That's my hypothesis. The degree of d is less than or equal to the degree of p. And in this case, I can almost do this by hand. Suppose I let m, <clears throat> so I want to multiply this by something and sort of like kill the top degree of that. So suppose I let m be a n over b sub s. So because the degree of p is n, a n is not zero. And because the degree of d is s, b sub s is not zero. So a n over b sub s, I can divide by a non-zero number. This is a perfectly good scalar number. So if I take a n over b sub s, x to the n minus s, n is bigger than or equal to s, so n minus s is positive. So this is a monomial. And if I take d and multiply it by m, what is md? m is a n over b sub s x to the n minus s times d, which is a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 down to a 0. So when I multiply through, the first term I get... So d is b s x to the power s, right? Sorry? d is a b s x to the power s, right? Um... Just one second. I just want to, I made one mistake along the way here. Um, sorry. M, M times D, uh, the D, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So this is my M, and this is D. Let's write down the right thing. B sub S, X to the S, plus B S minus 1, X to the S minus 1, plus B zero. So when I multiply across in the first term, the Bs cancel. I get a n x to the n. The next term is a n b sub s minus 1 over b sub s x to the n minus 1 and lower order terms. So m d is a polynomial of degree n and it has the first and the same leading term as the leading term of p. So if I take p minus m d, I'm taking this polynomial minus this polynomial. And the leading terms cancel. And what I get is a n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, and then minus this, minus a n b sub s minus 1 over b sub s, x to the n minus 1, and lower order terms. This is a term of degree n minus one or less. It could be this is zero. It could be this number equals this number. But this is at most n minus one. So the degree of p minus md is at most n minus one. And this is my r. So the degree of this remainder is at most n minus one. Or oh, sorry, in this notation, this is with the p prime. The degree of p prime is at most n minus one. But let me look at, um, well, we already looked at an example. Um, but now this is all we need to prove um, 
that long division is possible. Um, so, polynomial division algorithm. So you have polynomials, P and D, with the degree of D greater than or equal to zero, just means that's the same as saying D is non-zero. You can always write, so there exist polynomials Q and R, Q for quotient, R for remainder, such that P is dq plus r, and the degree of r is strictly less than the degree of d. So this includes the case when d divides p, the remainder is zero, and we define the, de the degree of zero to be minus infinity, and minus infinity is less than any other number. And the proof comes down to just the previous proposition. You start with P and D, and you find a monomial um, A. Um, some monomial px to the k, I'll just say, uh, such that p is d times this monomial plus the remainder p prime, where p prime has degrees smaller than p. And then I write p prime as d times some monomial plus something of smaller degree. So if I plug this in here, this is d times uh, call this b sub k x to the k, call this k minus 1, plus b sub k minus 1 x to the k minus 1 plus p double prime. And this has degrees smaller than this. It's a straight, the degrees of these remainders are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually you get to zero. That means eventually this is an algorithm that starting from P and D produces a quotient and a remainder that satisfy our degree requirements. Okay, so this is just long division. All we're doing is saying that long division is possible. And the next step is um, greatest common divisor. So we know what the greatest common divisor of two integers is. What is the greatest common divisor of polynomials? So suppose we have non-zero polynomials P and Q. So we say then F, a polynomial, is the greatest common divisor, GCD, of P and Q if it satisfies the following two properties. First, f divides p and f divides q. So the greatest common divisor of two polynomials divides each of them. And two, if g is any polynomial that divides p and q, then g divides f. So this is 100% the analog of the definition of the greatest common divisor of two integers. And the next step, which I will put off to Monday, 
is the following. So this will be proposition 1815. And you'll see this is exactly analogous to what we did for the integers. So for polynomials f and g, we define the set i of fg to be the set of all linear combinations af plus bg where a and b are all possible choices of polynomials and this set has the following very nice properties um, if polynomials p and q are in the set then their sum is in the set and their difference or equivalently their negative minus p. So if p and q can be written in this form, so can p plus q and so can minus p. For all polynomials p, and Q in the set I of FG, then P times Q is an I of FG. In other words, if you take any polynomial in the set and multiply it by another polynomial, you get a new polynomial in the set. And the third is if P is a polynomial and P divides F and P divides G, then P divides every polynomial in I of FG. And the corollary of this will be that in fact, every two non-zero polynomials f and g have a greatest common divisor and it is in the set i of f g so you take two polynomials f and g, you look at all linear combinations of them with coefficients that are polynomials. So this is a set <clears throat> that's closed under addition and subtraction. And it's not only closed under multiplication, it's closed under multiplication by any other polynomial. And the polynomials f and g have uh, at least one greatest common divisor which is always an element in this set. Uh, so that's pretty good. And then from that, we will get a Euclidean algorithm to compute the greatest common divisor. And we were able to prove the analog of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic for polynomials. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, one of the things I will try and finish up this weekend is a, um, a review sheet of problems for the midterm exam. So uh, I will try to email that out uh, this weekend to everyone. Um, midterms in two weeks. Any questions before we are done for the morning? So when are we doing the review for the midterm, Professor? Sorry? When are we doing the uh, midterm review? No, we're not. No, we still have more material to do, but I'm going to put together a preliminary list of review problems that you can work on.
Okay. Okay. All right, all. Uh, stay warm. Have a good weekend. And we'll be back on Monday. Bye.